picture? So with, um, you're, you tend to generally be known as a writer, <coughs> and yeah. one thing that I'm interested in is, is how you came to want to be a filmmaker. What about film kind of drew you in? Well, um, I started out wanting to be a novelist because um, I was very impressed with certain other novelists, and um, I was in this sort of Fitzgerald sway when I was 16. <coughs> so I went to college thinking that's what I wanted to do. and then. While there, I sort of decided that I didn't really have the heart for that. Um, the, the courage, the, the idea of being the lonely, you know, solitary writer all the time. So I started thinking about <coughs> what else I could do and how to, you know, write and tell stories, but um, have it more of an industrial enterprise. And so in the college years, I became interested in um, film or TV comedy. and. <coughs> One of the things um, you could do in college that sort of brought one closer to one's objectives was there was an undergraduate organization called the Hasty Pudding Theatricals, and they put on a very silly musical every year. And so I was, I had left college my sophomore year um, to write <coughs> and had the idea that I wanted to write a um, Hasty Pudding show. And so while I was in Mexico, I wrote a Hasty Pudding show. And I was also doing some journalism. I published my first semi-pro article for The Village Voice when I was 19 in Mexico. There was a lot of strange political violence going on. And I had worked in The Village Voice as a summer job this previous summer and uh, got the article in. And <clears throat> I guess the main thing I'd done um, at Harvard was compete for the newspaper sort of equivalent to the Daily Complainer in um, Damsels in Distress. And I mean, that was the, the Daily Complainer in Damsels in Distress is my version of Howard Crimson, definitely. <clears throat> I remember the guy, you know, s sort of standing up in the table and hand-ranging us <clears throat> when we competed. And there's a very tough competition. Uh, I think it's changed these days. But in those days, there's a grueling 10-week competition to get on the Crimson. <clears throat> And it took, um, you had to sort of work around the clock. Uh, you couldn't study, you just had to work for the Crimson all the time. And um, these experiences sort of went into thinking that in, in film I'd sort of have the same kind of experience. And it turned out to be true. It's very similar um, shooting a film as to being night editor of the newspaper, where you're bringing all these elements together and dealing with everything other people are doing. Um, <clears throat> And uh, I got out of college, um, and I had no idea of how to get from here to there. And um, I flailed around without a job for a while until um, <clears throat> a babysitting assignment. I was a friend's left, and, and they, they stuck me with his younger brothers during a, 
a, a baseball um, uh, pennant race for the Mets, so it was good. We had sort of entertainment while they were away. And the mother took pity on me, and um, when they got back, she introduced me to a guy who was sort of well-connected in literary circles. And he was a Wall Streeter, but he knew people at Doubleday Publishing, and he knew people at The New Yorker. So I had an interview with The New Yorker, <coughs> and I didn't get that job. And another guy from my class at Harvard named Sandy Frazier, Ian Frazier, he sort of got, got, they liked him, they didn't like me. And they thought he was funny, I was not funny. And then I <coughs> got a chance to um, interview for the training program, publishing training program at Doubleday. And because um, I, I, you know, it seemed impossible to get into the film business. And so I started working in book publishing. And what was the kind of industry context that was happening the, uh, when Metropolitan was being developed? Well, <coughs> that's jumping ahead many years. Uh, so the revelatory thing for us, I think, was when John Sales did The Return of the Sakaka 7, which was in, I believe, 79. <coughs> and I remember going to see that, and that sort of was the abracadabra, I think, for a lot of us, that, okay, you can be s sort of a short story writer and then make a really low budget film about stuff you know. And then <clears throat> at the same time, I'd gone over to Spain and the publication I was then writing for, um, editing, uh, it sort of paid us too much and then went out of business. And so I had savings um, and no job. <clears throat> and I went over to Spain to get married. And before getting to Barcelona, we stopped in Madrid. And at a dinner party in Madrid, there were these producers I'd read the um, Variety special issue <coughs> of um, on the Spanish film industry on the way over. I read it like three times, and I gave the impression I knew a lot about the Spanish film industry and a lot about films generally. And so I, I did know there was a pay uh, pay cable channel starting up that needed Spanish films, and um, that's called Galavision. It still exists, <coughs> and so. With the excuse of selling their films to Galavish, and they gave, they confided, you know, the right to sell their films to me. And I came up to Montreal. The first film market that was happening was the Montreal Film Market, connected to the Montreal Film Festival. That September, and I went up to sell my films there. <coughs> were these films that had been entrusted to me? And I realized you actually don't just sell to one country normally; you sell for the whole world. So I went back to them and um, got the world rights to sell their films. And so I was, you know, still writing short stories and, and f trying to write funny stuff, um, <clears throat> which I found very hard. Um, there are a couple of people who liked them. I think Tom Wolfe, the, the writer, uh, liked them. Um, but it was like too hard work to, you know, it was just so long to get a story that I was happy with. And <clears throat> one of the things I found was that in writing a humorous story, I wanted it to be a funny narrator who's not me. And so I had to create a framing mechanism. So there'd be some sort of n narration introducing a document by someone. And then that was the silly tone of voice of some absurd person. <clears throat> and um, after this experience I had in the Spanish film industry, it was like four years, and key was the um, summer of 83, um, two of the Spanish directors um, I was selling films for Fernando Treba, Fernando uh, Colomo, and they had been making these little comedies in um, Madrid in the early 80s. They were sort of John Sales but funny, and um, that was eye-opening too because that takes it another, it's closer to what I want to do, and, and one of the films is called Opera Prima by Fernando Treba, which did get a release here, and it was like a model for that kind of film. It's sort of like the autobiographical Truffaut comedies, <coughs> which I also really admired. And so um, <coughs> in 83, I helped Fernando um, Colomo shoot a super low budget film in New York, sort of reenacting his um, experiences in New York. Um, they brought over a really funny um, Spanish actor named Antonio Racines, and then we would reenact sort of conversations we had with Fernando. So I played. This, they, the character was supposed to be a photographer instead of a film director. Fernando was a film director. And I was his agent, so I was the photographer's agent. I, I had to do the scenes. That, but it wasn't important so much the acting in that film. It was seeing how a film could be made incredibly casually. 
there were just six pages of notes Fernando had. And um, I would call up places in the morning to try to get locations um, in the afternoon. And we'd go around, they'd go around, their crew, five people, in boxy checker cabs, put the lighting kit in the trunk and go. <coughs> and um, then the same summer, Fernando Trevo needed an obnoxious American psychiatrist character to be the bat, you know, the, the, the official um, boyfriend of the love interest of the hero, the Spanish hero. So I was the American um, jerk, Dr. Mortimer Peabody, a uh, psychiatrist. And, you know, they had a very sort of caricatural idea of how this guy would be. Because in Europe, um, psychiatry has the reputation in some countries as being sort of authoritarian and right-wing in a certain way. While in the United States, um, <clears throat> I mean, every, nearly every psychiatrist would be on the left. And in the, in the set, they had a picture of Ronald Reagan on this, in my office, supposedly, um, as a psychiatrist, which, you know, isn't what you really do. But anyway, it's a, it's a fun, fun job to have. And I was around there all, all, all summer. So while I was beginning to get into working in Spanish films, I had started the Barcelona script in 83 and then put it aside thinking, this is too ambitious to do as a first film outside my own turf. I will do something as small as possible that I know I could bring off. And the idea of Metropolitan <coughs> was to have something that could be essentially filmed in a room. And the added production value was going to be that um, the characters can be really dressed up and they're going to be wearing these evening clothes and sort of this poetical thing, the after parties, after these dances that we wouldn't have to see the dances, they could just talk about them or whatever. And that we try to get a pretty location, and so we'd have really, you know, low budget film, but kind of high budget subject, and it looked cool that way. And then writing the script, <coughs> it started getting bigger. And I also learned that um, you didn't have to just shoot in a room. For a very little bit of money, an insurance policy, you get permits to shoot in the streets of New York. So anything in public in New York is free to shoot. You just have to apply for the license, and you can shoot it. You don't have to pay anything. So Metropolitan started getting bigger. Now, was that image that you had of it going in, the, the moment in the film where they discussed Tolstoy's War and Peace and kind of that moment in New York? Yeah. So you're kind of yeah. building into it this awareness of how it all, like you are, I guess, identifying with that character to a certain extent, like this prominent image that drives the full film. Yeah, I mean, um, I'm not sure if I know how to write for other directors. So while I was writing the script, I was thinking, you know, it's a blueprint for the movie you want to make. And, and um, I remember an agent once telling me about a script that wasn't getting that good reaction from people. <coughs> it was getting a good reaction, but she felt it could get a better reaction if I had more uh, sort of screen directions. But I was writing it for myself, so I wasn't putting in screen directions because, I mean, I always find that tiresome in a script. You know, camera angles and stuff like that. You just want to sort of know what's happening with the characters and the rest is to be done by the director. And it's interesting <coughs> that there are kind of two competing protagonists. You have Tom and Audrey and I'm wondering how you kind of develop the structure of the, the story. The, um, it started out being the Tom story um, and I was writing that and then I realized at a certain point that um, he's not very sympathetic. His, his role is, is 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 sort of, he's sort of a flawed identification character because he is idiotic to not appreciate Audrey and then to pine after the Serena who's not giving him the time of day really. And so I thought, well, it'd be more simple story if 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 the Audrey character were the focus of it. So I had done a lot of work and I went and tried to make it the Audrey story. And I thought, well, if I'm do doing this, I'm going to lose all this other material that is kind of important. And so I went back and said, no, it's not really, it can't really be Audrey Strode. But out of that, um, I found something sort of interesting in writing it in that <clears throat> I had a beginning, which was the start of it originally was just going to be the um, Charlie character talking to a pretty someone empty had a debutante about God and yeah. God exists and it was the film's going to just start with a close up of them talking about God 
And um, <clears throat> then I had the idea of them meeting cute with um, Tom Townsend with a cab, the mistaking him getting the cab or not. And <clears throat> then I had another idea, which is, <clears throat> you know, to make the characters more identifiable, more likable, to show sort of that a lot of the girls who have to go through this really suffer in the process. They're under the illusion, sort of everyone's eyes are on them, and they're going to be the center of attention, and they get very nervous about that and worried about it and conscious of their looks and defects that they think in their looks. And I remember in that period in um, adolescence, it's very typical for young people as they grow to feel that either their nose or their ass is too big. And I think part of that is because in that period, that is how their body is changing. Suddenly the little, um, suddenly the little boys or little girl's snub nose becomes an adult's nose. And, and so I thought it would be, you know, in this bulky dress that she'd be concerned that, oh, my ass is too big or it looks bad in the dress. And so she runs down the hall. And I thought it would be a good image to start the film of a girl in a fancy dress running down a hall really upset. And then her mother consoling her and the little brother who's been teasing her and annoying. And um, so that became the beginning of the film. And then <clears throat> sometimes in endings of films, I also find you, 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 you get an ending that you think is good, and then there's another thing, another th sort of toppers. So that's the nice part of the writing process when you have enough <clears throat> going on with the characters that they start generating new material and, and stuff that helps put it in a better context. Of those three potential uh, introductions to the film, uh, the other two I wanted to talk about as well, the, uh, the meeting with the cab, is interesting because the audience kind of gets ensnared in the same way that Tom does yeah. very quickly uh, without any knowledge of this society or this subculture within the society and by the end the, the great joke is that he thinks that this is how it always is but yeah. he finds out that it isn't yeah. and I was, I was wondering he how sells out and <laughs> then finds out oh, I can't do this every week <laughs> when you were developing the script that that point at the end kind of what is what is behind that revelation that he seems to think they live this way all of the time, and then he finds out that, no, that's not true. Well, it's a typical thing when you get plunged into sort of, you know, a group of activities of certain kind that you just extrapolate, and you sort of, without thinking, you assume this is just always going to be this way. And then it's like, but it's like anything, it's like, um, you know, you go to a uh, summer resort, uh, August 20th and wow everyone's having fun and suddenly it's September 6th and 8th where's your film going <laughs> and it's that kind of thing except it's more serious because he's you know joining a class group that he has to compromise his political convictions to join his surrender his convictions or, or put them in abeyance and he, he compromises and then realizes um, he's on the losing team and it's all disintegrating <laughs> <laughs> and, and the <coughs> religious introduction with, with uh, Taylor Nichols uh, is, is great too because there's a shot before it, I think it may be just a Christmas decoration, but there's like a prominent cross that's yeah. shown right before that. The Helmsleys, the, Hel the eccentric um, couple um, who owned hotels in New York, and they had bought that building and renamed it the Helmsley Building. And one of their things was to you know, illuminate certain windows at Christmas time to make a cross. And um, we, a lot of these things in the films are not really planned. It's just you find something. And I wasn't thinking at all about the cross and, and the symbols in the cross. I was just looking for Christmasy stuff <laughs> we could put in the montage. And you know they say that montages should be odd numbers of images. So it should be either three or five or seven. And so we had you know, these images that we had three images or whatever that looked okay and we put that. And if we had four <coughs> images that looked good, we might have dropped the cross and put it in something <laughs> else. Uh, <coughs> with the bringing up the, the, the God conversation, though, yeah. it's interesting how that, that does kind of uh, fall away from the film after that point because they tend to debate a number of different issues and, and religion tends to be an important part of subcultures or people's beliefs, but it's mm. kind of a notable absence that that develops for the rest of the film, like even especially talking about Fourierism and things like that. I don't know. No. God, I, I, you know, never occurred to me to have any more of that. <laughs> um, and and by the, 
I, I guess the symbolic importance is something that is a, a part of the text in this film. It's something that Nick mentions uh, outright with the collars, and then you have the toys that are being left outside. That the, there's a kind of this unabashed joy of symbols and what things mean and what they say about you, and that can be uh, drawn with the the dress as a whole for this this culture. You know, when you're Working a script, you're you're s serving the water, or trying to keep your head above water, and and you know, splashing around, and um, you find um, you know an image and material, and um, you know the idea of of this coincidence of the toys or whatever, um, and you're not really thinking in um, in those terms. I don't think. So I, I don't think I really was. The uh, <coughs> it is something though that as characters that they you, they put a lot of thought into w the decisions they make what they support is like Nick making the point of bringing up the cha cha and like kind of drawing upon things in the past and not wanting to let them go not wanting to kind of subscribe to this notion that everything is necessarily getting better that there can be maybe a forward movement that includes well it's explicit the in the film it's explicit in the film because um, <coughs> you know um, I think Audrey when she talks about Jane Austen examining our day, you know, and I think um, we tend to um, um, <coughs> um, have a kind of derogatory attitude towards many things in the pa in the past to deprecate. Then we pick something that is kind of comical or ridiculous or or you know in one way or another not admirable, and we focus on that, and we don't focus. You know, in the same way on ourselves and and strange things of today. And, and that commentary on Austin is interesting because it's it's pretty self-reflexive in the story. It's something that is kind of commenting on the story as a whole. Mm -hmm. and I'm wondering when you're writing, is there maybe a danger of being too self-aware in the script or too? I mean, I was just looking for pieces of material that I thought would work with the characters, and um, I mean. It was big for me because I generally can't read fiction when I'm trying to write something that's fictional. So normally, if I'm in fiction writing mode or script writing mode, I'd mostly not be reading novels. Um, I'd be reading other things. And, but it, the exception for me was, for some reason, I found reading Jane Austen while I was trying to write very helpful. And so I'd be sort of dipping into Pride and Prejudice and just reading a page or two in my breaks and then going back to it and that came in really as a piece of material because I had this friend who'd always get things wrong he he was very opinionated and and sort of um, didactic about things he knew um, that I didn't know because generally he had read much more broadly and, and better than I had so he'd tell me about Lionel Trilling saying no one can take you know Janelson seriously anymore today because of the concerns about, you know, the concerns in Mansfield Park that are ridiculous and blah, blah, blah. And um, so I was hearing this from him and I was angry at Lionel Trilling for putting Jane Austen down, putting, putting down Mansfield Park. And then I finally read the essay he was talking about and it was just the opposite of what he was saying, that he starts out saying that. He starts saying other people might, it's really essentially other people might say that, not we. And then he gets to what he thinks, which is he thinks it's valid, he thinks it's good. And so um, I had this, with this friend of mine who later became an investor in the film, I had so many contretemps with him disagreeing about material and, uh, and you know, point of view and stuff. And, uh, uh, and maybe I just misheard him. Maybe he was right, you know, right from the start. But anyway, the way I got it was, was that way. And um, that just seemed to work really well with those two characters that, that Tom and Audrey would have those arguments. I think one of the most interesting aesthetic elements of Metropolitan is kind of the fade outs that are constantly happening. Mm -hmm. where it kind of structures the film in an interesting way that's not really realistic, and that's what I enjoy. It's not, it doesn't have the pretense of documenting everything. It's kind of you're getting these little uh, moments that are almost like memories. Like if you were looking back, you'd remember certain lines of dialogue, and there's mm -hmm. no real consistency to the length of them. And I was wondering how you kind of came across that formal device as. It was in the editing room. I'm, I doubt if much of that, I don't know, I'd have to look, look at the script to see uh, how many of the fade outs were, were in the script. 
I have a feeling a lot of stuff was added in the editing room. It would be really interesting for me. I should have actually looked at the original um, screenplay before we talked if I knew you were going to be so specific, <laughs> um, to see where that came from. Or maybe it's, I mean, it's irrelevant, really. At some point it came in. Um, I was greatly helped by the, by the editor, Chris Tellison. Mm. Uh, we worked very closely uh, in the editing phase, and um, he had a lot of good ideas. And he, um, he'd worked for Scorsese a lot and sort of saw what um, Scorsese's editor, Thelma, would do. And I can't remember whether Age of, I guess Age of Innocence was after. But he, I kn knew that there were certain editing techniques Scorsese was very interested in. In Age of Innocence, he does that thing with the, um, cl you know, closing the iris, spotting to spot someone that was interesting. So when you were finally able to kind of develop the, the Barcelona script, did it change in any dramatic way from kind of what you were planning uh, like a decade before? Um, it w hadn't been, um, oh yeah, you're right. So I stopped writing it in 83 and I picked it up again um, in 90. And yeah, it didn't have, um, I don't think it had much to do with, uh, it just had the idea of the two cousins. And the, I, I find it interesting, it's the one film of yours where there's a, a voiceover narrator. You kind of get the thoughts of, of um, Taylor Nichols' character. Yeah. Was it, is that writing process more liberating or is it more challenging to include something like that? Well, it's liberating f as for the writer, but it's a real problem for the director. <laughs> there's this huge prejudice against um, narration. I don't believe in formal prejudices against things like not against flashbacks and not against narration. Nothing really formally of that kind would I be against. But it's really hard to get it to work. It's hard for it to be integrated. And we have the advantage because we're doing a comedy. So we can do things that would be kind of boring in a drama. So his narration is tying in normally to a joke. Um, so. He's saying this thing in a very sort of tolerant way in the narration, and then his cousin gets there and he says something really irritated to the cousin, which is often the way it is in life. There, there seems to be a recurring theme in the film uh, that there's two sides to kind of every story, and that can include national stereotypes or you know whether or not a kayak was stolen or yeah. <laughs> um, I mean, I think that um, Barcelona is the least fair of my movies. So, um, <clears throat> I mean, I really, I have a point of view, but I like to try to be fair in a movie and not stack the deck. And so that um, the audience can come and take what they want out of the movie. They, they don't have to react one way or another and um, they don't have to feel the same way I do about the characters. And I think where I was unfair in Barcelona is, you know, I'd been yanked into Spain by falling for someone and marrying a, a Spanish woman. Falling for and marrying a Spanish woman. And I'd been pulled into her world. And I was very much an American. I did speak Spanish, but I wasn't living in Spain <coughs> full time most of the time that's portrayed in the movie, that period, and I was just getting sort of this political stuff that was going on there and reacting against it. And so the deck is kind of stacked for the Americans and against the Europeans in um, Barcelona. And if I were to do Barcelona now, after having lived in Europe so long subsequently, <clears throat> I mean, I'd try to be just fair to the Americans, but I'd be fair to the Europeans too, I think. Try well, it also just reflects the fact of where you're coming from, and I think that's something that comes across in the, in the film, which is kind of gracious about misunderstandings, especially I love the, the uh, disparity between recognizing jokes and um, what that means for like the Jim Beam bottle. It's a very subtle thing, but it comes up at the end that, oh yeah, he was just joking, but we didn't know that because we had only had one perspective. Mm -hmm. So it, it seems like as much as it's maybe the deck stack, there is that level of awareness that that happens no matter what, or it's something that people are prone to. Yeah, I have no idea what you're saying, but it sounds <laughs> good. 
makes sense. Well, I guess it's like the concept <clears throat> that, like the pejorative thing, like w- even words, like when when prey oh, is yeah. used. Like yeah, the other night, um, the other night that came up, and I think the the onset change there was he's s- talking about I think the women in Barcelona being promiscuous mm, or yeah. something, and. And, and Fred chastises him for that, and, and then Taylor says, I didn't mean that pejoratively. <laughs> and then, um, yeah, then, then Fred calls him a prig, and, 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 and uh, Ted protests. He says, well, I didn't mean that prig pejoratively. I'm not saying prig pejoratively. <laughs> Which it I think is actually good. I think prig should be used in a non-pejorative sense. It, it's also a film where were um, something that exists in Metropolitan, which is people tend to say what they are, are thinking immediately. And it's something I noticed in Metropolitan in the, the early uh, scene discussing the letters that were written, because it just doesn't seem like most people would be so forthright with volunteering all of that information that that Tom had written those letters. And in, in Barcelona, that becomes uh, a part of the text when there's the conversation about text versus subtext, or the quote about, uh, was it George Matthews Adams about speaking, um, uh, what is it, bluntly and honestly, as being this kind of uh, great trait. And, and it's an, an interesting theme in your films because it, it makes them funnier, it makes them more... Is that like really him or is it Frank Betker or something? He's, I think he's quoting oh, like yeah. in the, in the <laughs> self. Oh, Charles Smith, yeah, 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 yeah. And it, it's something that's kind of an unreality that I find really interesting. It's almost like a fantasy, like you can just say what you're, you're thinking in these films. I don't know. You know, I, I think I was trying to portray something that I thought was real and, and exists and was not, was not different from the way people do behave and talk. Oh, you find people that are, are that forthcoming? They don't... Yeah. Maybe um, up here in Canada, people are <laughs> forthcoming, but I think Americans are forthcoming to to a fault, or mm. actually beyond, way beyond fault. <laughs> <laughs> the the intimacy of the conversations in Barcelona, I, I find interesting because you you have the kind of in the bed conversations that didn't really exist in in Metropolitan, which is usually in the the parlor or yeah. the the living room. And I was wondering uh, how you approached kind of the the relationships that existed in, in Barcelona. Um, I don't know how I approach them. I don't. I don't. I don't see a difference between how they are, except they go to bed. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. I don't, I don't know what the. I, there's no difference. I don't. I, I don't see any difference in the first three movies of how things are treated. Well, there's like a <laughs> recurring theme in, in these depictions of relationships with people, with groups and like yeah. group mentalities. Yeah. I mean, um, I think that a lot of the material in those films comes out of a, a moment I lived a little too intensely, which was coming out of college. Um, and finding the world completely, sort of the New York world I was in or, or the way things were in the United States, to my eyes, I think it was an illusion. Um, to my eyes, there was no social texture. There was no interlocking sort of things of people knowing each other, families knowing each other, you know, a coherent society where people are in a context, a context where your friendship and knowing each other and all this. <clears throat> and I think I was reading probably too much um, 19th century fiction and reading a lot of Tolstoy. And the thing I found so wonderful in Tolstoy is there's this whole Russian society and you know they know who Pierre is and he's controversial for this and he gets involved with Helen and knows her f- family and what that is. And um, you know, it just seems so marvelous, and I regretted that I didn't see that in New York or in the United States, and that the films are kind of recreating a fantasy of social cohesion that I didn't think existed, mm. but I pine for. But in the long run of one's life, I see that, no, there is more cohesion than I thought. Um, and uh, so I was creating these kind of utopians of groups of friends and all this. Um, it's like a lonely person inventing playmates and friends, mm. and but then 
in retrospect, there were things where people do get together and there, and I do think there is that tension between group social life and the individuals pairing off. That is a big issue, and people should be aware of it because I think a lot of probably nice relationships are wrecked because one of the two people um, is really identifying with the group and doesn't have the courage or their mm -hmm. convictions, doesn't have the courage to pair off with someone else, just worrying about the group and what they think. And when the group doesn't really think, I mean, the group, you know, people don't really care that much about other people if they're not just directly 100% involved with them. So you can have your friends and say, but this concept young people often have that, um, oh, if I do this, my friends will think badly of me, and they'll all be thinking all this. People aren't thinking about each other that much, mm -hmm. generally, I mean, one hopes. And um, the people can become kind of group-oriented and tyrannized by the group in a ridiculous way, because the group really isn't that concerned with them, mm -hmm. and will quickly go to think about something else, or that they move away, and these people are so important to them, and their whole life is dominated by you know, the approval or non-approval of these people, and suddenly they're completely out of the picture, and maybe it's an email or a phone call, but it's much diminished. It's incredible, I find, with email, <clears throat> that theoretically you can write an email to so someone anywhere in the world. Um, you can write an email I, probably to an astronaut in the space station, but you actually tend to have all your emails going to the people who are in the same town you are, even if it's not just the stuff of making an appointment to have coffee together or whatever. And that we have the geography in our heads and as we're in a thing, we, and suddenly all the people we're frantically exchanging emails with them and you just completely lose touch with them. Hmm. And is that kind of what builds towards the melancholy uh, with the group uh, disbanding in, in the end, especially maybe in Metropolitan maybe as the most melancholy in its conclusion, but it, it's kind of there with, with each of the films. Yeah. Yeah. When I was making the film, I didn't realize sort of all the birthday parties to come, the decade birthday party when people turn a decade and suddenly all those people again. So um, thanks to the movie Metropolitan, I got in touch with the people I'd known then. I hadn't really been mm. in touch with them. So I'd sort of gone off to an internal Spain in New York, and I started seeing them more. And uh, so the Tom was wrong; the group doesn't disband. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's interesting that when you do bring back older characters in Last Days of Disco, you can kind of see that maybe their trajectory is not what a viewer would expect when they saw the end of those films. Like you have Taylor. Uh, Nichols, uh, his character in Barcelona, being paired with someone that you maybe wouldn't expect by the conclusion of Barcelona, or Audrey not being with Tom. Well, it's very important. Um, I mean, uh, the idea with Metropolitan was that this is a, a tentative college romance, so that it shouldn't be marriage, mm -hmm. it shouldn't be forever, it should be, you know, the first real boyfriend, girlfriend, and that they wouldn't end up together. Um, and in Barcelona, that was real drama because um, I was going to have the Ted character, played by Taylor Nichols, end up with the beautiful Montserrat character, played by Tushka Bergen. Um, but as I was writing it, I was observing people around me and relationships around me, and I, I lost faith in the opposite attracts idea that these people are very opposite in their points of view, coming together and everything being great. Um, and talk about that in the novel, uh, The Last Days of Disco mm -hmm. with Cocktails of Petrosian. The sort of, there are these film myths, it's great in a film to have opposites attract and get together, it seems interesting, but I don't think it's that good necessarily in real life. It can work, you know, there are many cases, but it's probably not a good plan. And, and if, if we were talking about the group um, social life. That, that is ten, tends to be the, the most prominent theme in, in Last Days of Disco. And one thing I find interesting is that the place that everyone congregates, this utopian space of the, the club, it, it's also there's a gatekeeper too. So there's an interesting tension between getting... Yeah, I would, but see, I would say the true heart of the group is not the club, it's Rex's. Oh, really? So I think the bar mm. is the... And it's a wonderful place where we shot that. It's the Old Town Bar. Mm 
which is sort of a beloved place, and it's become our kind of headquarters and commissary. And they, they really enjoyed the shoot. Um, we had a good shoot in there, and they put up um, you know, a poster in the, in the second floor, and we did the interview with the New York Times for the cast, and so they put up that article and all that. And so now, with damsels, when we need to meet people um, to do stuff, like when we were trying to learn country and western dancing, there's a country and western Saturday night um, dance. It's actually the, the gay and lesbian group was the only group that really had an active um, country and western program. So we got all the actors together and the choreographer, and we went to this to learn how to, you know, dance. And for that, we met at the Old Town Bar and had like dinner before, cocktails before. And you know, when anything came up, we'd always go there. So it's like Rex is continuing from disco into the shoot for Damsels. Um, and and with the last days of disco, it seems like aesthetically, there's a little bit more of a- ambitious camera movement that's going on. Like I'm thinking of some stuff in the club, but also the yeah, I the hate sh- that stuff. I hate that ambitious camera movement. Well, the shot from the the, the main monument uh, when Josh is talking, that I find that to be a really interesting and pivotal moment in that film. I was wondering what you were maybe going for visually with that. Well, um, during a key part of um, the screenplay, I called myself up in the Essex House Hotel um, for a couple of weeks to finish the script because I was under the gun and we had the competing disco uh, project we wanted to get ahead of. And when I was walking around that neighborhood, I just saw that monument and um, I, I love reading, you know, about American history and that period, and I love that sort of architecture. I, I adore it, and the, the monument is so evocative in real life, and we just want to bring some of that poetry and sadness um, of the monument and of its situation in New York into the movie. And John uh, Thomas, you know, really achieved that. Mm. <coughs> the cinematographer John Thomas. Mm. And, and I think the Kate Beckinsale character, Charlotte, in that film is maybe the most interesting one you've got because I think maybe she's the most uh, unlikable but likable also. Like There's a real balance going on there that can rub certain people the wrong way and other people can kind of gravitate towards it. Mm-hmm. And I was wondering how you saw her, especially related to the Nick character in, in Metropolitan who seems like a little bit more of a benevolent version of her. Yeah. Well, um, I think that I probably made a mistake with that character where I think there should have been more warmth. I think there should have been more warmth and eccentricity in some way. I think people could feel that the character becomes too grating. At the end, I think you get that. You get the nicer thing. Um, and um, I mean some people say and I'm not sure if this is true but some people say it that an actor can come from abroad and do an American accent beautifully um, but that sometimes in doing a foreign accent the sort of warmth of their performance or their human warmth won't come through that much because they're just wearing so much or they have to do this other job of mm-hmm. getting the accent right. So I'm not sure if it was, you know, the way the Charlotte character was written, but I'm really glad that you got that. Maybe maybe it's getting through. I just wasn't sure that it was entirely getting through, that we want this character to be kind of... I mean, I want all the characters to be, except maybe Rick von Sloniker, all the characters to be lovable at some level. Mm-hmm. Someone loves them. And um, that we can love them in a way, in spite of their being acting like terrible bitches or what bastards, whatever. Well, she's self-aware when she says that she kind of has a sick compulsion to say whatever she's thinking. But you feel by the end that maybe she's realized how to kind of channel that, like find people that it, it matches with that big personality. And it, it's maybe like, as you were saying, kind of like the group leading to a kind of pairing off, but in a in a way that's maybe progressive or it will. Well, I think an interesting issue with films of this kind is um, the problems of communication. What was that thing from Cool Hand Luke? What we have here is the failure to communicate or (laughs) or problems of communication. And I think it's probably what hurts, you know, the 
the mass audience, a lot of mass audience films, they're trying to be so clear and so obvious mm -hmm. in what they're communicating that they make it kind of boring for the rest of us. But in our f kind of films, it's very dangerous because I'm just constantly shocked by my failure to communicate the way people, I mean, I said that thing earlier that I'm being hugely contradictory now of people wanting to take different things from it. But within them taking different things from it, I think that the sort of humanity or likability of certain flawed characters should be receivable mm -hmm. by people. And um, I find uh, with Damsels, uh, which, is, which is still coming out, so I'm sort of really aware of it, I just totally shocked by, and, and there, it relates to the Charlotte character in Disco, because I feel that the um, Greta, the uh, Violet character in Damsels, and the Charlotte character in Disco are in certain ways very similar, except they're entirely different, mm. in that, that Violet is sort of a lovely person. And these things of sort of admitting faults and liking criticism is sincere and good-hearted with Violet, while in the Charlotte character, it's just another level of annoying fakeness. Mm. So not only is she, you know, needling everyone else constantly, but she, whatever they are, she's gonna be better than they are at that. So she's gonna be, m when the thing is to be sort of cool and adventurous and sexually experienced, she's gonna be the most sexually experienced. When it comes to being, when we're being religious and moralistic, she's gonna be the most religious and moralistic. You know, she always has to be kind of beyond. And, and um, what I found, th the problem of communication with damsels is I'm just c constantly shocked by people who cannot get over the very superficial brittleness of the Violet character at the beginning mm -hmm. of the film. And they just will not get beyond that. And so it's, it's kind of uh, preoccupying. It sort of means that those studio note givers who are telling you make this character more likable, they have to be more likable, you know, they're answering commercial requirements. Well, Damsels is kind of an ambitious film in, in its, its structure because it, you kind of have to go with the flow as an, as an audience member and you have to be open for it heading in directions you're maybe not anticipating. And yeah. I think that maybe that's why some people have difficulty with that because they want to they want to feel like they have a foothold immediately mm -hmm. one of my favorite moments in in film watching was a james ivory film i really admire a lot of what james ivory does um and he did a film that's very close to the life i was living because it was based on a book called the soldier's daughter um never cries it's by kaylee jones the daughter of the novelist james jones and he was living with his daughters um, on Ile Saint Louis in Paris, and uh, at the time I saw the movie, I was living with my daughters in Ile Saint Louis in Paris, you know, trying to write. And um, it was a very accurate, very warm, and 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 sort of fascinating view of this Parisian expat world. Um, and then suddenly they're not in Paris; they're in New Hampshire or something like that. And um, you don't know what is happening in the story, and I was thinking, oh my God, I don't know what this movie is doing, you know, what is happening here? And um, I really doubted it. I said, well, this is bad, or what's it? And then it sort of fell into place, and, and a different kind of story happened, and it reached its resolution really well. And I really especially like that film, because at one point I was thinking they had completely lost their marbles, <laughs> and I didn't know what was happening. I, I think that's a good thing. I want to be surprised. I remember a Castle Rock film um, called, I think it was called Malice, and I think um, it had Alec Baldwin, I can't remember whether it was Nicole Kidman or someone else, but um, I'd seen the trailer and it made it seem just like such an obvious, stupid film, and I had no desire really to see it based on the trailer. And we were um, out on Saturday night to see a movie. We couldn't get into the movie. We wanted to, so the only thing that was kind of playing then was Mouse. Oh my God, I'm gonna go. But uh, you don't want to be loyal to Cast Rock because you know there are our friends in the company and you know, see Cast Rock film. But it, I really dreaded it. And then in the middle of 
malice, it was not about the thing the trailer was talking about, it was about something completely different, <laughs> I was completely faked out. And that's such a great experience when you're faked out in a really great way. There's a, a line in Damsels that I really like that I feel kind of encapsulates the film, which is, uh, I believe it was around the moment where they're debating the relationship between morality and the size of one's posterior. Oh, yeah. And there's the line that um, it's not logical, but it does seem true. <laughs> and I think that that's kind of the, the viewing practice you have to have for the film. Like, yeah. Uh, especially the fact that all of these characters all have their identifiable quirks, but they're very confident in their own skin within those quirks. And I was wondering how you kind of developed characters like that, especially uh, uh, so many, not just a single character. Well, the only thing I can think of is this idea of sort of dialectical dialogue in that um, I sort of, if people are gonna make observations about things, you know, it can be funny, but it's good if it's funny and true. Mm. And then, I am incapable of making a sort of affirmative declarative sentence and sticking with it because I make an affirmative declarative sentence and then I think, well, oh, there's so many exceptions to that <laughs> or that's not really true. And then that becomes dialogue in a certain way and it becomes the battle between the Tits and the Freds. And is, is this something that uh, the, the film concludes with footnotes to follow and I'm wondering what that says about, is, is that like a relationship to how disco had its own novelization that kind of expanded it in interesting ways? Or? Well, that was sort of a last minute joke as we were doing the tail credits, which was the typical thing if someone's trying to end a term paper. Uh, I think it's, yeah, footnotes to come. The, the, you know, someone is pulling an all-nighter to hand in a term paper and hasn't really done the work. They always put footnotes to come. And <laughs> we thought at the end of our college paper, mm. we'll just put footnotes to come. But it was kind of marred by the fact that we actually did have some notes we had to put <laughs> in because, um, uh, I remember. I, uh, I remember uh, an IMDb someone catching a mistake in uh, disco, but it wasn't a mistake. So they say it's thing about the plu perfect or the past perfect. I can't remember. It was the dialogue between Bernie mm -hmm. and Nick, and and Bernie acts as if he's caught Nick up in a lie, using this grammatical thing about the past tense that he's using. And um, so we were going back and forth about exactly what the past tense was. And then I was thinking, it doesn't matter what the actual grammar is. Nick doesn't know. Bernie is pretending to know. All he, Bernie does is need to pretend to know something grammatically to put Nick on the spot. And so, you know, a lot of times in a movie, and then people correct us about the Cathars in, um, in, uh, damsel saying, well, the actual Cathars is just a Catholic slander against the Cathars at this. But then I know people who use the Cathar line. <laughs> on, on, I mean, I, kn I heard stories of people who, who did that with their girlfriends. And so it doesn't matter mm. what the actual Cathars did, it's just there are people going around doing that. And so this is sort of the ignorance of the characters is completely justifiable and we can know it's ignorant or haven't checked exactly what the thing, it doesn't matter because it's this dynamic between the guys and these people do this sort of fact checking thing. Mm. It's nonsense, it's so arrogant because they don't get the whole deal with, with fiction. And, uh, but in the case of Damsels, I really had gotten confused between Ricard Strauss because I wanted to get into the Ricard thing because I, I had a funny experience about that once. Um, and. Johann Strauss, the, the actual mm. Waltz King. And because Richard Strauss, you know, has wrote some great waltzes, but he wasn't the Waltz King. And walking to one of the sort of test screenings one day, um, or walking from it, the composer, you know, someone said, is that intentional? That, that mistake, and I said, what, what, what? <laughs> what? And I was, I was completely wrong. I mean, I, I didn't know. And so we thought we could make another joke with mm, that stuff yeah. in the credits. And also the fact that she had, you know, made up the things about Charleston. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, it's, it's also, there's another phrase that comes up uh, that maybe pertains to some of what you're saying and maybe even the, the dance sequence at the end, which is that uh, the concept of the pointfully absurd, like that something can be both absurd but intentionally so. Mm -hmm. Yeah. When What's you're your launching, question? when you're launching that ending, which, which yeah. I think kind of is a dividing line between the expectations modern audiences have for realism oh, and yeah. then going back to this kind of this dance sequence that seems very very unreal like it's a film it's something you'd see in a film and it kind of 
willfully takes you out of it. Oh yeah. I mean, the inspiration of that was something we loved in disco, which is the very end. Mm. And there we sort of weren't entirely courageous because we put it like really with the end credits mm. where we go out of reality and it's the disco fantasy of everyone dancing in the, in the subway station. But it was a wonderful moment for us in the film, in disco, and I really liked it. And so I thought that, you know, our lead character, Violet, has been rehearsing with the Suicide Center um, crowd a musical. And they've had that song, they've been practicing. And that to bring the whole cast in with a performance of that would be the right, I'm not sure if apotheosis is the right word. I get in trouble with pretentious words. <laughs> um, that this was the, the logical, poetical culmination of all that. And then the Sambola dance sequence mm -hmm. would, but that's again the second idea of an ending. So I had the things they're looking up, that was the ending. And I said, oh no, we should do the Sambola. And so that's what that was. And I thought it was, I mean, I love that idea of doing that. And I think it's really the right way to end the movie. And I think it's very clear what the storylines have been resolved. And I mean, it's sort of, you talk in the whole film about dance graces and musicals and, and dancing, and then that's how the film should end. And it just amazes me that all the resistance we've had to that, it just seems really, some people just will not get airborne. Well, it seems like that's almost anticipated in the film when you have the, the character that is uh, clearly uh, displeased that, that Greta's uh, dancing and using the the tap shoes and the kind of noise that that creates mm -hmm. was was that something that you were expecting or was that, were you kind of taken aback by the resistance to this? No, I'm taken aback. I'm sort of disappointed. I, I think, you know, I think people were dumb about reacting against that um, because I think it's it's the logical conclusion. Um, no, that was just to try to sort of raise the idea of Violet being embattled. Um, and misunderstood, and I think one, another, I'm um, still in the throes of, of advocating and defending damsels, so another thing that um, I found really, um, it's so funny, the people sort of think you just made mistakes, and, um, and yeah, I'm sure there are mistakes and things, but someone who I think should have, a, a, not really a critic, like a journalist or a columnist or something, wrote something about damsels and was very disappointed that the whole story, you know, the story should have been about Rick at the Daily Complainer and Violet, that that should have been the antagonism, the mm. whole thing. And that is just such a lame aspiration because that would have been the boring version, the boring political version is a political columnist, so I guess that's part of his territory. but. Um, it was interesting to me as a writer because I was stuck on the script. I had written that scene and I'd written a few other scenes. I'd written the other Depressed Debbie scene and I was thinking of having Depressed Debbie, the Aubrey Plaza character, ultimately Aubrey Plaza character in the Suicide Center, collaborate with Rick from The Complainer against, you know, disloyal or, or collaborating against Violet mm. to foil off. And then I just stopped writing and I just had tons of trouble writing. It went really bad. And then I realized I don't I don't wanna have it about Rick and politics and you know, I don't want it with this Debbie character and the Rick character. And um, until I decide I am not telling that story, I don't want that story, I want the story going somewhere else. It's about Violet and, and what she's doing and um, I was able to go on and, and, and that was the last big problem I had in writing the script. And I cut out the scene where um, Depressed Debbie, um, later played by Aubrey Plaza, um, attacks Violet about the tailspin thing and depressed and is loyal to Pris and takes Pris aside. Um, and I'd taken that out because it's sort of too much negativity, I thought it was kind of boring. And then when I really liked Aubrey and she was, you know, auditioning for other parts and I thought she was really funny. And um, she really wanted to be in the film, she said. And so she had a week's hiatus and could fly east to be in the film. 
And um, I think her agent said at some point you mentioned to her that there are more things she could do as Debbie. Um, and I put, I looked at that scene again and put it back in. I think I probably rewrote it or something, put it back in. And I'm really glad I put it back in. I mean, it, because I think it really helps the um, movie to have that conflict and to have the whole thing about Tailspin. And um, so that was good. Uh, that that was rescued. Thank you, Aubrey. One thing I like about what you did choose as the actual ending is that it's a film about uh, characters that are kind of trying to positively change the world around them in a meaningful way. And kind of the trajectory of the film is it it eventually impacts the film where the, it, it almost seems like that's the, the ending that the character would have devised for that film. Exactly. And it's kind of... It's as if the character, the protagonist, has done the ending. Mm -hmm. um, and I mean, I was surprised at how, what a great dancing job and everything job the choreographer and the actors did. I thought it looked terrific. And I just am really kind of shocked at when people say it's lunky and clumsy or they're not very good or something. And, you know, some people have really kind of a negative thing in their minds that they project on the screen. Like, mm. I th sometimes I feel that, I mean, if you're being a defensive filmmaker and someone doesn't like what you've done, the first thing is to say, well, they're dumb, you know, they're not intelligent, they're not getting it. But I think more important, if I was being defensively attacking them, is I think it's kind of a character test. A lot of these people who have these very negative ideas about the characters and how unlikable they are, I think they must be unlikable people themselves to not have more charity and, and love for these flawed characters, that a nice person would see that there are they're nice qualities to some of these characters. And the, this idea that the dancing um, at the end is clunky or clumsy. Or, and I sense that they said about Greta. And I think they also must not really know what tap dancing has been in musicals. I mean, there's kind of a Ruby Keeler uh, quality in Greta's tap dancing that's absolutely lovable and charming and great. And, and Ruby, I mean, have these people seen 42nd Street and seen, you know, like what that kind of tap dancing was? Because it seems like she sort of wonderfully channeled that 30s great feeling. And, and now that there's been the gap between the first three films and Damsels, when you're, when you're approaching new projects, which we don't need to talk about specifically, mm -hmm. unless we jinx them, um, is there that... Is wood. There <laughs> no wood around this. Where's wood reading it? There it is. Okay. Is there a compulsion, or is there? Do you feel maybe freed from the feeling that maybe it has to connect with damsels? That now every film doesn't need to necessarily have that, or is that something you're looking forward no, to? No, I've doing? been really kind of encouraged just in the last month that thinking that the next two projects I have in mind are, you know, flights into unreality in certain ways, flights into stylization mm -hmm. unreality, and I really want to explore this. I think it's mostly the Jamaican film when it comes, and I think in a way the Jamaican film is the missing link between the other films mm. and Damsels, and because it was planned before, because it it has angels and demons, funny angels and demons, and I think you know whether or not the disco in Last Day's Disco is realistic. I think you can say, I don't know, maybe someone's very very orthodox believer and, and, and won't think this, but if you have angels and demons, funny angels and demons in a movie, it's probably not going to be realistic. The aspiration <laughs> in that movie is probably not realism. And so I hope, you know, they won't come with a realistic yardstick and judge it on that basis. I mean, I, I, I have a real fight going on with Verite. Huh. Do we have to cut? It's, no. it's too long. Um, a lot that I've learned in, in cinema is thanks to uh, the cinematographer John Thomas. Um, and um, in, when we're doing Barcelona, we're going to do a lot of those sort of travelings, those, those shots with the Ted and Fred driving around cars, talking. Mm. And um, John said, now, do you want to show you know, the reflection of the leaves in, in the window? Do you want to shoot it that way of the car? And I said, what do you mean, reflections of the leaves? He said, no, if we just shoot it without the proper lighting, it'll 
you'll see the reflections of the exterior leaves on the windshield, and you'll see the characters through that. I said, why would I want to see them through reflected leaves, something? No, of course, I want to just, so you just said, I'm sort of thick about these things, so I have to you know, ask him, so, you know, oh, yeah, yeah, just do the you know, good lighting. We just want to see the characters. We don't want to think about the windshield. We just want to see it. And then ever since then, you know, I started saying, why would we want to see reflective leaves in the windshield? Huh. And I, I've looked at a lot of films, in, and I, when I see leaves reflected in a window of a car, when we really want to see the actors, I think it's a bad film. Mm -hmm. I think that is my, it's going to be a bad film. Um, because it's the false idea of realism. That isn't realism. In our heads, um, our imaginations are not photographic in that way, and that's a false photographic verite. And so, cinema verite is this great lie. It's a great lie because the camera is very cruel and very destructive, and the humanity of people, their inner reality, is not going to be caught by a verite camera. And those things that try to be very ver verite, they become incredibly distancing and dehumanizing. And um, so that's one rule. Uh, a film that, that shows sort of the, reflection, the actual reflections of leaves and windshields, it's going to be a bad film. I mean, I'm sure there are exceptions. To these <laughs> the other thing is that if you're thinking the first 10 minutes of a film, oh my god, this art direction is great. I mean, how do they do this? This production design is great. The cinematography, this shot, this tracking shot, this, oh my god, that's wonderful. It's going to be a bad film. <laughs> if you're thinking about that, it's a bad film. Well, thank you for, for chatting with us. Thanks a lot. Can we end on a positive note? Or we've gone through the mag. Um, I don't know. Maybe we can rejig it in the okay. editing room. Okay. I just didn't want us to get in trouble. Oh, they're opening up the. Yeah. That was That's fun. Thanks a lot. Oh, thank you. Thank you for the Tim Hortons. That's all the difference. <laughs> Glad you could restock while you're here. Is that a good book, Brighton Rock? Yeah, I like it.